We follow the order of service on page 184. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, poor miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death, of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, and for a simple you. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord and Savior, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue with the responsive reading of the introit as it's printed in the bulletin. It is God who executes judgment. We give thanks to you, O God. We give thanks, for your name is near. At the time set, at the set time that I appoint, for not from the east or from the west, but I will declare it forever. Glory be to the Father and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. It is God who executes judgment. be to God on high.
Lord be with you. Let us pray. O Lord of grace and mercy, teach us by your Holy Spirit to follow the example of your Son in true humility, that we may withstand the temptations of the devil, with pure hearts and minds avoid ungodly pride, through the same Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Our Old Testament reading this morning comes from Proverbs in the 25th chapter. It is the glory of God to conceal a matter, but the glory of kings is to search out a matter. As the heavens for height and the earth for depth, so the heart of kings is unsearchable. Take away the dross from silver, and it will go to the silversmith for jewelry. Take away the wicked from before the king, and his throne will be established in righteousness. Do not exalt yourself in the presence of the king. Do not stand in the place of the great. For it is better that he say to you, come up here, than that you should be put lower in the presence of the prince whom your eyes have seen. Do not go hastily to court. For what will you do in the end when your neighbor has put you to shame? Debate your case with your neighbor and do not disclose the secret to another lest he who hears it expose your shame and your reputation be ruined. This is the word of the Lord. Our epistle reading day is from Hebrews, the 13th chapter. Let brotherly love continue. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by so doing, some have unwittingly entertained angels. Remember the prisoners as if chained with them those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. Marriage is honorable among all, and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man do to me. Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do not be carried about with various and strange doctrines, for it is good that the heart be established by grace, not with foods which have not profited those who have been occupied with them. We have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp. Therefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Therefore let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek the one to come. Therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But do not forget to do good and to share, for with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Obey those who rule over you, and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. Let them do so with joy, not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. This is the word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 14th chapter. Now it happened as he went into the house of one of the rulers of the Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath, that they watched him closely. And behold, there was a certain man before him who had dropsy. 
Jesus answering spoke to the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? But they kept silent. And he took him and healed him and let him go. Then he answered them, saying, Which of you, having a donkey or an ox that has fallen into a pit, will not immediately pull him out on the Sabbath day? And they could not answer him regarding these things. So he told a parable to those who were invited, when he noted how they chose the best places, saying to them, When you are invited by anyone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in the best place, lest one more honorable than you be invited by him. And he who invited you and him come to, to, and say to you, Give place to this man. And then you begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit down in the lowest place, so that when he who invited you comes, he may say to you, Friend, go up higher. Then you will have glory in the presence of those who sit at the table with you. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Then he also said to him who invited him, When you give a dinner or a supper, do not ask your friends, your brothers, your relatives, nor rich neighbors, lest they also invite you back and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed, because they cannot repay you, for you shall be repaid at the resurrection of the just. This is the gospel of our Lord. We confess our saving faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one of Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, he got of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, he got did not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us in the conscious life. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended to heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory, to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified. He spoke by the prophets, and I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead, and life after the world to come.
grace and peace be to you in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Our text this morning is from the Gospel reading, verse 11. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. There ends the text. Your friends in Christ. In Jesus' day, people in general had a very different way of looking at themselves and looking at the world in which they lived. Much different than what we have now in modern America. Sociologists who have studied early Jewish culture have shown that the people then defined themselves in terms of their tribe or their family. So they didn't see themselves first and foremost as individuals They saw themselves as links in a chain. So if you saw a man in the first century as a Jew standing on a street corner, you would not identify him as John the Butcher, the guy who likes fishing on weekends and who used to play a little ball when he was younger. You'd identify him as John, the son of Zechariah, the son of Joram, the son of Eldad of the tribe of Joseph. His existence as an individual, based on his individual accomplishments or achievements, that did not define him. His relationship to his family, his tribe, and his community, that's what defined him. Now, we Americans, we don't think that way. We don't think so much about family ties or relationships as defining us. When you look at me this morning, you do not see me as Matthew, the son of Walter, the son of Otto of the family Rieger. You see me on my own terms. Good or bad, you think of what I've done, what I've said, and you frame your image of me based on that. So we exist as individuals, first and foremost in our culture. Our world begins and ends with ourselves. So that everything else that matters around us only matters in as much as how it relates to us personally. Now as we live day in and day out in this self-first culture, we cannot appreciate how deeply and profoundly it affects the way we think and look at the world. I mean, we aren't even aware that our looking at ourselves and this world is any different than the way anybody else in the world looks at things. But it is different. For example, on one of the trips that the church made to Lithuania, a group from the church went to a restaurant to eat. And one of the group was lagging behind and came to the restaurant late. He walked in through the front doors without saying a word to anybody and was looking around. And a waiter came up to him and he said, well, the group you're looking for is right over there. And the young man that this happened to said, how do you know what group I'm looking for? I haven't even said a word. You don't know I'm American. How could you have known that? And the waiter said, well, it's the way you carry yourself. What do you mean by that? Well, you Carry yourself like an American. You walk with your head up, looking around as if you own everything. (laughs) The reason I mention all of this is because of the reading from Luke today. Jesus ran into a very American problem. Even though Luke is set in first century Israel, Jesus saw how the people at this feast he was at We're looking at the world as if they were the center of it. And as if everything else revolved around them. He went to eat at a Pharisee's house. Not just any Pharisee, this was a ruler of the Pharisees. Luke says that he watched these religious leaders jockey for position to get the best seats at the table. The most important Pharisees, or at least those who thought of themselves as the most important, took the most important seats. The lesser Pharisees, they got the poor seats. It was a competition of egos. And added to that was the way they were treating Jesus. Luke says that they watched him closely. They're watching him suspiciously. They don't trust him. They don't like him. 
Because Jesus, he didn't follow the rules that the rest of the Pharisees made. In fact, he seemed to ignore a lot of their laws and rules, including even Sabbath laws. And at this feast, Jesus does it again. He breaks Sabbath law right in front of them. He heals a man who had dropsy on the Sabbath. Now, dropsy is what, what we in our day call edema. It's an accumulation of fluids in the body, so a swelling of the limbs. It makes walking hard. It makes breathing hard. In Jesus' day, there was no cure for this kind of fluid buildup in the body. It was a slow death sentence. But Jesus performs a miracle. Cures the man's swelling in his body right there in front of them. And to us, we would have been amazed. But for these Pharisees, it was just something else to hate Jesus for. Because he did it on a Sabbath. They didn't care that Jesus just alleviated a lifetime of suffering for this man. All they cared about was that the Sabbath said you weren't supposed to do any work of any kind, and healing was a work. So keeping their man-made rules was more important to them than having compassion on the needy and the helpless. That lack of compassion, that extreme love of keeping laws over everything else is just a symptom of the overall problem. Their rules-first thinking, their honor jockeying at this table, letting their egos run wild. It's all pointing to the same basic root sin. The sin of self. Self-deification. It was all about them. Even their law-keeping was all about them. They were kind of like the watchdogs of the legal code, like policemen with religious zeal. They loved the law, not because it served God, but because it was their source of respect and honor in the community. So the law served them in a way. All of it is just another form of idolatry, of holding up self over and above everyone and everything else. And despite the Jewish cultural mindset of the day, which should have seen self only in relationship to tribe and community around them, they saw themselves first as the center of their own little universes. And I would argue, my friends, that that kind of idolatry, that holding up self as the most important thing in the universe, is the very sin that threatens us in our culture on a daily basis. Because we live where this is normal. Everybody seeks himself. Everybody wants to express his or her own uniqueness and how we're different from everybody around us and how different is good. We are American to the core. Especially when it comes to going through life putting number one first. And we don't even see it as a bad thing. It's normal. Think of how many conflicts we have had over the years with other people because we wanted it our way and they wanted it their way and we didn't want it their way. Self has become our God, whether we know it or not. And that is a damnable sin. It doesn't even feel like a sin. On this lesson and with this exchange in the with the Pharisees, Jesus teaches us not to put self first. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Humility is giving up oneself for the sake of the other. It is the stronger yielding to the will of the weaker. It is setting aside what I want for what others want for their benefit. And Jesus uses this feast he's at with the Pharisee to teach them about how to set themselves aside for the sake of the other. When you give a dinner or a supper, do not ask your friends, your brothers, your relatives, your rich neighbors, lest they also invite you back and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind, and then you will be blessed, because they cannot repay you. 
Jesus' words there don't just condemn the Pharisees, they hit us too, don't they? Because when's the last time you had a, a dinner and invited the helpless and the poor instead of just family and friends? I include myself in that same condemnation. Jesus is not, however, just advocating a new or better moral principle of humility here. Because Jesus, he wasn't the moral an ethical teacher. Jesus was in the world to teach about the true God and about the heart of God toward us as fallen creatures. And at the very heart of God himself is humility, a yielding up of self for the other. As God reveals himself to us in his word, in our lives, God does it by yielding himself up for us. The infinitely stronger for the weak and sinful. He who deserves all honor and glory became as nothing in this world. The Almighty became weak and poor. He who was eternal took mortal flesh and blood so he could feel pain and experience hatred and contempt. That's not just something God did. That self-debasing sacrifice is something God is at his core. Christ is God's heart on display for the world to see. And it is through humility, through yielding of himself, that God ultimately overcame the demonic self-seeking of our world. Jesus yielded up his life in a terrible way so that we who were estranged from God might be reconciled to God in his flesh. Jesus' humility. God's self-emptying love in his Son. That's what defines us as a people today. That is what makes us who we are, not just what we do. So here in Luke, as Jesus addresses the Pharisees about humility, he's not doing it as a moral principle. He's instead teaching them something about the nature of God and God's love for them in the world. God's grace, his self-emptying love, was right there in front of them in the flesh and blood of Christ he was there to embody God's saving humility. And all they had to do was open their eyes up and see him standing there. Jesus invites us to see him standing there. To open up our eyes and see him in our lives as the one who defines who we are because of what he has accomplished on our behalf. We don't have to get out there and buck up and try and show more humility. We just need to be the new creations Christ made us to be. You, my friends, you're already redeemed. You're already set apart from the world around you. You're clean, you're purified, you're washed by the grace of Christ in your baptism, not by the force of God's will. By his sacrifice, by the stronger giving up himself for the weaker. That's who you are now. So as new beings defined by God's saving humility, you are free to go out into this world and yield to others, to help the poor, the needy, to be kind to those around you expecting nothing in return. You are free to be a conduit of God's love for fallen humanity and through your witness and your self-yielding to show forth Christ in this world. Again, it's not about doing. It's about being. You are Christ's. His heart his mind, it's now in you. Now, sadly, Jesus' lesson was missed by the majority of the Pharisees who were sitting with him there. 
there were, mind you, a small handful, a few, who did know what Jesus was driving at, who did believe in him as God's self-emptying love in the world to save them. And they, and they were saved, but the majority, the majority didn't get it. In fact, some of these Pharisees even turned humility into a, a new exercise of their ego. Going out showing humility as if, hey, I'm more humble than you are. Now, a prayer this morning when we see this teaching of our Lord is that we might not be like the majority of these Pharisees who hear with their ears but whose faith never comprehends the Savior right in front of their eyes. Instead, our prayer is that God might soften us, humble us, teach us humility, teach us simply to be what he has made us this day, when he's poured out on us the forgiveness of sins yet again, when he has washed us, made us right with him, and infused us with the humility and love of his Son. Christ is our life. He is our humility. And he not only saves us, but he sets us apart in this world, makes us new creations to live in his image. Thanks be to Christ. Amen. Now may the peace that surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.
We pray. O Lord, our God, we deserve to stand condemned before you and cast from your presence. We have indeed sinned against you daily. But we thank you for your boundless love and mercy. For you have delivered us from damnation through your Son. And through his humiliation has drawn us out of the world to reconcile us with you forever. We pray that you cheer and sustain us with this gift of self-emptying grace. As your children, we will one day be privileged to rejoice in your presence forever. We pray that you help us now in this world. Help us against our flesh, that we may not yield to pride and ego, but rather that we might reflect your humility to those around us. Deepen the trust that we have for Christ who died. Keep us steadfast and immovable in your word. And grant us a heart of compassion and love for those around us. Dear God, with the tender touch of your mercy, we pray that you look upon all who are sick in any way this day. Treat with compassion those among us who suffer. Be with our sick and our shut-ins as well, comforting them with your saving presence. And with the, pre with the promise of your ongoing grace and love, bless and cheer the lonely. Help us, we pray, for the sake of Jesus in whose name we pray. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who out of love for his fallen creation humbled himself by taking on the form of a servant, becoming obedient unto death, even death on a cross. Risen from the dead, he has freed us from eternal death and given us life everlasting. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying... Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same manner also he took the cup after supper. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. 
The peace of the Lord be with you always. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Let us pray. 
We give thanks to you, almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy, you would strengthen us through the same, in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord be with you. Bless we the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen.